So Hebrews, Hebrews chapter eight is the chapter we're reading tonight. Now the main point of what we are saying is this, we do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle, set up by the Lord, not by mere human beings. Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices and so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest. For there are already priests who offer the gifts prescribed by the law. They serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle. See to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs, as the covenant of which he as a mediator is superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. For if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said, Days are coming, declares the Lord when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they did not remain faithful to my covenant, and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete, and what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. Okay, um, could, could someone let me, oh, I can share the screen, that's okay. Okay, now I have to apologize, my wife has told me that this is the most boring PowerPoint she's ever seen, um, but the reason for that was we're going to be flicking back and forth all over the place tonight, and really it's just, it's just so you don't have to try and look up the verses as we go through. Um, there is one picture, but only one. But my apologies. Okay, so first of all, let's, let's have a quick recap um, of Hebrews. Oh, sorry, let me just get rid of this. So just just quickly recapping on the book of Hebrews so far. So this this book was to the Jews and not to the Jewish leaders. It was a warning not to turn back to the old ways. And it talks about the superiority of Jesus and the new way. And these these points here, they really it's it's such an apt summary just just in itself of this chapter. So We'll work, we'll work through it, um, but just keeping those, those points in mind. Um, so last week, David talked about Melchizedek. Chapter 7 was all, all about Melchizedek, and it was also all about a covenant. And this week is also about the new the covenant, or the new covenant. Um, we talked about last week that the attention was to go onto the position of Melchizedek and not onto the man himself. And this is really re reinforced by our first verse. And the first verse refers back to chapter 7. So, so in this first verse, we... We're jumping right in with the main point of the chapter. Now, the main point of what we, was, we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest 
who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. And this is a referring directly back to the last few verses that David talked about last night from where David left off at the end of chapter seven. And we're going to revisit it because I think David, you referred to the fact that these, these verses are just, they're just so good. So back to chapter seven and reading from verse 26. Such a high priest truly meets our need one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of his people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests men in all their weaknesses, but the oath which came after the law appointed the son who has been made perfect forever. So what, what do we have from this? What, what are we given from this? We have, we have a high priest like this. You can almost feel that Paul's excitement in this verse. Now the main point of what we're saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. And our high priest, this man who truly meets all of our needs, is sitting beside our God, sitting at the right hand of, jo of God. And he's ministering to the true tabernacle, a, a tabernacle that's pitched by God and not, not a tabernacle that was pitched by man. So Paul refers to the priests of the day in, in verse 5 and in the priests of the past. Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. And so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest, for there are already priests who offer the gifts prescribed by the law. They serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle, see to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown to you on the mountain. The tabernacle or temple the priests were serving in was nothing but a, it wasn't, it was only a copy or a representation. Hopping back to Go back to Exodus, uh, chapter 25 and verse 9. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern that I will show you. So it's interesting that even back in the time of Moses, what was, what was given to him from God was just an imitation of something greater. It was just a picture or a representation of what was to come. And Paul notes in verse 2 of this chapter, and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not a mere human being. So the priest of ours, Jesus, serves the true tabernacle. In comparison between the old and the new, where Christ is a new tabernacle, where God will talk with man. So it's not a tabernacle set up by mere humans. The tabernacle given to Moses was a place where God could meet with man, and a place where man could worship God. However, this could only be done in a very imperfect manner. We're the most holy, but this was hidden away, not to be seen apart from one time every year. And even, even when it was seen at that one time, it wasn't seen by the people. It was only seen by the, the one person, by the high priest of the time. The normal people, the people of the day, the you and me's, um, the vast majority were unable to approach the place, were unable to go in. And none of the sacrifices or offerings that they had actually removed any of their sins. They were really just a reminder that they had the sin. So the whole law of Moses, including this structure, just pointed forward, pointed forward to something better. 
everything really under the law of Moses pointed forward to that, that something better to come. Every item of the law really just cried out for a more perfect way, the way of Christ. In John we three, John 1, verses 14 and 15. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out saying, this is the one I spoke about when, he, when I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. And Jesus spoke of himself as this temple. He spoke of his own body as this temple. And in Matthew 12, verse 6, I tell you something greater than the temple is here. So we have Jesus himself here calling himself greater than the temple, greater than the tabernacle. The Hebrews of the time and, and us need to serve God, or needed to and need to serve God, in and through Christ, the true tabernacle the one from whom who the copy was made, not through a tabernacle made by a mere human, even if these humans were blessed by God to be able to do an amazing job in a, um, on the original tabernacle. In Christ, the glory of God is not only seen once every year on the Day of Atonement, but all the time. In Christ, we know it's possible to be able to find true worship and also true fellowship with God and with Christ as the high priest. We're able to obtain true forgiveness for our sins. That verse 3, every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifice. And so it was necessary for this one to also have something to offer. Even with even with Jesus being sinless, he still needed to make that offering. And we meet every Sunday to remember him and to remember his, his sacrifice. And I do think it's important to remember that he he didn't have to make the sacrifice. He didn't have to do it for us. We know that he had options to not follow God's will. Um, and to go his own way. So it really was a sacrifice. It's not a sacrifice if it's something that you don't have to do. For us, Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice to God. So just looking at some of the details around this, we're going to pop back quickly to last week and then forward to another couple of verses. So last week in chapter 7 and verse 27, Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. Under Aaron's priesthood, the high priest and only the high priest brought blood into the inner sanctuary, only one time every year. Jesus used his own blood for all time, and he did this for himself and for his people. Chapter 9, verse 12. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once and for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. We know that right now Christ is acting as our high priest and he gives us a way to approach our God. He is the one who offers our prayers to him. And this is so we can come to, with confidence and in confidence to God. Hebrews 4 verse 16. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And thirdly, um, Hebrews 13, verses 15 and 16. Though Jesus, through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. The fruit of lip. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God 
the sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name and do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifice God is pleased. In Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. So with the offerings of our high priest, our good deeds and our righteous actions are a sacrifice, a living sacrifice. It's only through Jesus that these sacrifices have any meaning. It's only through Jesus that these are acceptable and unblemished, and it's only through him that they have any value at all. Jesus is the true tabernacle or dwelling place for God himself, but when but but when believers are baptized, they come into Christ and with that become part of that dwelling place that is pitched by God. 1 Timothy, Timothy 3 verse 15, the house of God, the ecclesia of the living God. If I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. Or in 1 Peter 2 verse 5, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And Ephesians 2, 19 to 22. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling place which God lives by his spirit. So then, we now come to the real crux of the chapter, verses 7 to 13. For if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they did not remain faithful to my covenant, and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my laws in their mind. I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. So here, here Paul presents his, his whole argument here, and he, he lays it out and works through it and then proves that the old covenant, covenant, he proves that the old covenant with the people wasn't final and it wasn't the end place. And we see here how, how clever he was, how, how inspired and guided he was. He, he works through this and then proves it with their own scriptures. So just, just skipping through from verse 7. For if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, 
no place would have been sought for another. The old covenant was faultless in morality and in its own commandment. It didn't come, it did come from God. It did come from God after all. There, there wasn't anything wrong with this with the this covenant. In fact, in Romans 7 and verses 12, Paul refers to it. So then the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, righteous and good. The problem was with it was that it was not there to save man. It couldn't really save man. Really, all it could do was condemn man because everyone sins, apart from Jesus. There had to be a better way, a much more powerful way, and this is where it pointed to Christ. So verse, verse 3, for what the law was powerful to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering, and so he condemned sin in the flesh. Sorry, that was Romans 8 verse 3. Verses 8 and 9, but God found fault with the people and said, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel. And with the people of Judah, it will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors, where I took them by their hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they did not remain faithful to my covenant, and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. So when God found fault here, he didn't find it with the law. We just looked at the law, and that was given by God. The covenant given by God was, well, was was fine there was nothing nothing wrong with it at all what god found fault with was the people who were unable to keep the law when paul here is talking about the new covenant it looks as though he's quoting jeremiah 31 verses 31 and 32 the days are coming to clear the lord when i will make a new covenant with the people of israel with the people of judah it will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by their hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. So God had promised this new covenant even before the old one started. He promised it to the new covenant to Abraham, to Isaac and Jacob. And the difference was that its effects were to be forever, not to be concluded until Christ is reigning and the inheritance uh, is given. So verse 10, this is the covenant that I'll establish with the people of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I'll put my laws in their minds and I'll write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. And in the old King James Version, and it is a bit different if you look at um, the likes of the NIV, but in verse 8 in the old King James, we have both Israel and Judah mentioned. But once we get down to verse 10, it's only Israel as one that is mentioned. The two houses have now become one house again. Like Ezekiel saw in his vision, they'll be reunited. Ezekiel 37 22. And I'll make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all. And they shall be no more na two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. The future kingdom will only have will have only one Israel. The future kingdom will have only Israel as one nation without the division that has split them. And this will be the finishing of the new covenant which began with. Christ. And this is what the people have been invited to share in. The kingdom split after Solomon and never never joined up again. So with this, the new covenant has not been realized for them and must be in the future with Christ as its high priest. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 3. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by it, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. So 
that we need to be ready and able to receive God's engraving and to be engraved by the Spirit. This is what happens to us when we enter into the new covenant. Hosea tells us that God said of the nation um, in Hosea 1 verse 9, then, God, then said God, call his name Loami, for you are not my people and I will not be your God. But what we've got here in verse 10 is a, is a direct reversal of this. I will be their God and they will be my people. The new covenant had not come along to destroy the old one. It had really come along to improve it. It was an offering, it was offering a reversal of what had previously happened that the people could once again become gods. Verses 11 and 12. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. So the priests would no longer have a need to teach every man his neighbor or his brother to know the Lord. There'd just be no need for this because everybody will know him. Not just the kings and priests, but from the smallest to the greatest, they will all know him. At the end of the new covenant, Jesus will reveal himself to the Jews who will mourn what their ancestors had done to them and mourn that they had so long ignored his teaching. And God will give them guidance to bring them to the new covenant. In Jeremiah 3 verse 15 we read, They will give you pastors according to my own heart, according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. In Isaiah 30 verses 21, and thine ears shall hear a word behind thee saying, this is the way, walk ye in it, when you turn to the right hand and when you turn to the left. And last we leave, we have verse 13. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. So we know that God had promised a long time earlier, 600 years earlier than this, and before this was written, that Jerusalem was about to fall, about to fall in AD 70, and with that, the whole mosaic system that had grown, grown old was about to vanish away. And Paul's warning here, and going back to one of the points of the whole of Hebrews, this undoubtedly, his warning here must have saved many Jews from returning to the old law. All of this is very typical of us today, and Paul's words are very important to us as well. We've all left the old system, which can offer us nothing. We've come outside the camp to Christ. We have to make sure that we don't return in any sense to the ways of the old man or to the systems of the world, which will soon be completely destroyed. 